Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Easy Power Thursday webinar series. My name is Jim Chastain. I'm the host today for this session. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, for those of you that are not attended before, as long as you've registered and attend this presentation, we will uh, send out certificates of attendance that uh, many folks use for EAU towards EAU credits. So look forward to that. And before we introduce our guest speaker today, I'd like to uh, run some poll questions, which we are in the habit of doing. And so here's what we're going to be looking at today in terms of different types of circuit breakers. And uh, the first question is fill in the blank, multiple choice. Which circuit breakers contain a trip unit? Expecting a few late arrivals, so this gives some time to catch up, but at the same time, it helps our presenter know how to target the audience with uh, emphasis during his presentation. Looks like we've got a quorum, and here's how folks have weighed in on this one. So it looks like it's fairly widely spread. Good. And the second, again, is a fill in the blank. And that is uh, a UL489 listed multi case circuit breaker blank include non delayed trip elements. So the choices are may include, must include, shall not include. And let's give this a few seconds. Well, many, well, many of our poll questions. Uh, deal with opinions and uh, in some cases topics that are subject of discussion or argument from different points of view. We will actually have the uh, the answers to these questions as we as we get to the end here. So here's how folks have weighed in here. Looks like it's a little bit of a split. And then the last question is what does LSI stand for when it comes to trip units? So we pick one of these three choices. Good. So yeah, we've got pretty much the expected attendance. Thank you all for attending today. Thank you. Here's how folks have weighed in. It's kind of a landslide choice there. So something tells me maybe <laughs> maybe we're too easy on you. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, there were actually right and wrong uh, answers. So here's what the answers look like. On uh, on this poll question, and this gives uh, our speaker some insight into how to engage and uh, where to uh, emphasize in his presentation the different segregations of equipment. So Andrew Legro has over 20 years experience in the electric power industry. He provides engineering support services to MEP and electrical engineering consulting firms for ABB. He joins us from Lake Mary, Florida. And Andrew, you have the podium. OK, I should be unmuted, hopefully. Yep, sounds um, good. Excellent. Share your screen. Let me, um, let me show my screen. Oh, go back one. Yeah, well, um, good good uh, morning and good afternoon for everybody. Um, afternoon for me, because I'm, I'm in Florida. I'm actually uh, like Mary slash Orlando area, so uh, I probably got better better weather than, than most of most of the rest of you. But I'll suffer in the, in the summer, so and that's fine. Um, yeah, as Jim said, um, I'm a uh, been in the in the power industry for um, a long time now. Um, I started out um, at Westinghouse years ago in a, the Pittsburgh area where I grew up. Um, so I had a lot of, a lot of industrial, um, like industrial power kind of experience. And then, and I got to move to Florida and, um, I joined up with an engineering group that did a lot of healthcare projects. So I worked as a, as an MEP consultant and, um, recently past five years, years I've been, so yeah, now I'm with, um, with ABB, um, I, I came from the General Electric side. We were acquired, you know, so merged um, about four years back. And um, 
I work for a team uh, doing um, field applications throughout the country. So our job is to um, consult and interface with the uh, uh, engineering uh, firms, um, mostly. Uh, and uh, it, it's a really, it's a fun job. And um, my contact information will be here. And, uh, you know, you can always feel free to reach out to me. And then depending on where you are in, in the country, I can, I can connect you up with your, your local um, field applications uh, team member. Uh, so enough about me. Um, let's get to it. Um, this, this class is about um, trip units. And so we're kind of zeroing in on, on a really specific piece of the circuit breaker and also a piece of, um, of easy power. Uh, but, you know, it's very it's a very important topic because that's really the thing that you engineer when you design a system with circuit breakers. And a lot, you know, 50% of it is uh, how it'll trip, what it'll protect, what it can do, um, and then the rest being uh, where you can apply it with fall current, things like that. So this will just be the um, uh, discussion of, of the trip units. Um, so what I want to do is, is provide an overview of um, uh, overview of the technology and the range, and then go into where each one is applicable per your per your situation. Okay, so what is a trip unit? Uh, pretty obvious question. Not a common term, but um, to understand what the trip unit is, uh, we first have to define what we're talking about with a, with a circuit breaker. So uh, I think, and I came up with this definition, and hopefully it's good. Um, circuit breaker is an electrical switch designed to automatically detect and eliminate short circuits and overload. So I think the key word there is automatically, and the, the automatically part is the trip unit, because without the trip unit, the breaker is just a switch. Heavy duty switch, but it's just a switch. So I'm calling the trip unit the brain of the circuit breaker. It, it, it um, basically measures physical parameters, and, and mostly that's current. And then it decides whether or not to open the, or trip the breaker. And uh, they're built into the circuit breaker in, in these cases. And uh, it may or may not be um, changeable or replaceable depending on the manufacturer or, or model. There's a wide wide variety of different um, types and styles and designs of circuit breakers from various ma manufacturers over the various years. So it's, it's a pretty broad topic. And some of the terminology I'm using is what I know. There may be conflicting terminology and definitions. So uh, you know, don't get mad if I'm saying something that you disagree with. Um, you can always you know shoot me an email if you want to discuss it. But this is sort of my my education on it, um, so that will be as it may there. Um, this is just a picture of a, uh, let me see my yellow highlight. Here's a kind of cutaway view of um, an ABB circuit breaker. Uh, so it shows a trip unit here at the top. And then um, I think this is a probably a 1200 amp breaker. Um, but then it shows kind of cutaway of some other features in there, a Kirk key lock. There's a shunt trip in there. I think that's it there. So just kind of a nice picture of, of the different components of the circuit breaker. I'm breaking this down um, into what the trip unit uh, uh, kinds of breakers it goes into. And generally, there's three classes. There, there's your moldy case circuit breaker. Um, it's abbreviated MCCB. And that's what you'd see in uh, panel boards, uh, switchboards. Um, UL49, that means... Um, uh, that's the UL standard for um, essentially uh, panels, panel breakers, and switchboard breakers. Typically, 15 to 1200 amp, one to three pole, and um, uh, it's the most common. I mean, that's 99% of the breakers that you'll see are going to fall into that into that range. Then your then is your insulated case breaker, which is kind of a hybrid between a power circuit breaker and a molded case breaker. Um, it's meant to be um, non, no serviceable parts, similar to the molded case breaker, but it's a higher power rated breaker. And more importantly, it's a, um, a stored energy breaker, um, 
where you charge a spring and you can take multiple open and close cycles with the um, with the spring charge. Whereas a Moly case breaker has a single trip spring, so when you set it and it trips, that's it. Um, and you don't crank a handle to charge it. In the insulated case, this handle here is what you pump six or seven times that charges up the, the springs. And that's very similar to a power breaker. So it's this interesting hybrid that sits in between. Now, the thing you need to know about it is that it's 489 listed, so it's only a three cycle rated device, just like your molded case. But the ranges it comes in are pretty much similar to the power circuit breaker. And that, now we get to the power circuit breaker, LV, PCB. That's primarily in switchgear construction. And um, its listing is UL1066. And um, it's a 30 cycle rated device. These are current ratings. And what makes it interesting is that when you get to the UL1066 devices, you don't need instantaneous protection. And that was one of the questions. So when you're into 489 listings, you need to have a non-delayed or instantaneous trip because the, the actual uh, stuff it's protecting, the bus is connected to, is only rated for three cycles. So if you get that short circuit, you have to come offline um, without a delay. Uh, power circuit breakers, the bus is rated for 30 cycle. So you can essentially sit there with a high, high fall current um, and wait. And then what you're waiting for, hopefully, is some of your downstream protection to operate. So that, that's what provides you with selectivity in, in breakers. So when you're back in molded and insulated case breakers, they all have this overlap on the instantaneous protection. So it makes it, it, makes it very difficult to coordinate them fully. And then that's, that's, a, loaded, that's a loaded topic. But um, they do have an instantaneous overlap in most cases where if you had a high enough fall current, you may trip the main versus the uh, feeder breaker. Uh, you may trip uh, possibly and likely both. So that's the difference that I'm trying to trying to convey is the um, the 489 versus the 1066. Now here's and then this is interesting, and I, I always kind of like the history of, of how these things came about. But the the trip unit term only applies to low voltage circuit breakers. When you get into circuit breakers that are in the medium voltage and high voltage range, they don't have integral trip units. So you buy the circuit breaker and it's just a switch. So you have to also specify the relay that acts like the trip unit, but they're separate components and you specify them separately. Um, they're ordered separately. They can be from different manufacturers. So we could have a, um, you know, we build switch gear at, at ABB and um, back, vacuum, medium voltage vacuum switch gear, and we'll install uh, Schweitzer relays or um, multi-lin relays. Uh, we have we obviously have our own line of relays that are good, but a lot of customers spe uh, specify because of their install base, they might be a, a Schweitzer user or an ABB user, so they want that relay, but they want ABB's breaker. So uh, it's mix and match. And that's the big difference between the um, the trip unit and the low voltage breakers versus um, the medium and high voltage, what they're called a circuit breaker. Okay, let's get into the, um, the trip unit types, the basic technology overview of, of what they are. I broke this into three types, and there definitely could be some argument about the last two, but I broke it into thermomagnetic, and that's pretty cut and dry, and then solid state with limited adjustability, and then solid state microprocessor. So let's start with the thermomagnetic. By far, this is the most common uh, type of trip unit in use, because virtually every circuit breaker um, that you see, all, all residential, um, lighting panels, appliance panels, all those contain thermomagnetic breakers most of the time. And uh, let's see here. The, the common things that they have are they're, um, they have two components to it, obviously a thermal component, and that's your, uh, that's uh, usually it's, it's a bimetallic strip 
that heats up and bends to uh, cause the breaker to operate. And that basically looks for overloads. And then there's a magnetic element and that picks up at, if you exceed a certain amount of amps, it'll pick up immediately. So that's your instantaneous protection in, in the magnetic part. So thermal is your time delayed, magnetic is your instantaneous. The pros are very low cost. They're simple to configure. And most of the time there's no, there's no dials or adjustments available. Tried and true, they've been around since the beginning of time. Uh, well, the beginning of electricity, I guess. The cons, they, they offer very limited protection. It, it, it's a, um, they're good for cables and some small transformers uh, and they provide you know, adequate protection for that. So they're kind of a, a code minimum solution, but that's gonna to apply to you know, a lot of your jobs, uh, commercial, even industrial, uh, so they're 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 the um, ubiquitous breaker out there. They're low accuracy, and and they're low accuracy essentially due to the thermal element because um, and we go to the next one. They're sensitive to the ambient temperature. So if you have a hot if you have a hot ambient, that breaker will tend to trip early. If you're cold, the breaker is going to trip long, and that's on the order of seconds or tens of seconds. So it's a big it's a big wide gap so the accuracy is just um it's not uh not very good but usually what it's protecting in terms of cables and transformers they're also sensitive to the ambient so they kind of match up so uh, you know in the early days of electrical loads when you were we were really your breaker was just protecting a cable or was protecting a transformer or a panel board these were fine and they still are in, in most cases they're difficult to coordinate and we'll get we'll get more into that uh, then we get to our our next step up which is a solid state breaker and solid state's another weird term because solid state technically meant when they transitioned from vacuum tubes to discrete electronics uh so that got assigned to this type of breaker and then and then that's that's just the way it is so they're called solid state, and they have a pretty broad range of how that can be implemented. Could be, you know, discrete components. It could be a microprocessor. So it, it wide variability. Uh, pros would be um, uh, you can get enhanced pr protection, um, and usually you get adjustable. And uh, usually you can get an adjustment. It, it is a wide variance. So you can get a uh, really simple adjustment, maybe a, what they call tracking. Where you have one dial and it adjusts both the um, instantaneous and the um, long time and delay all with one dial or uh, you could get into a full lsi breaker which is which is the breaker that has a a uh, long time short time and instantaneous adjustability that was one of the other questions so lsi stands for um long and long time short short time and then instantaneous separate separate adjustments Con, oh at one of the pros it's ambient and sensitive because because it's electronic it tends to be i think all of them today are relatively insensitive to the ambient temperature for the tripping now the breaker mechanics themselves um you know the breaker itself has a a, a maximum temperature range and a derating based on current but the trip unit isn't sensitive to the ambient temperature cons it may not have full adjustability and usually they're um they're limited in how many advanced features uh, you can put on the breaker but they're a pretty good middle ground and they're coming down in cost so you can get a solid state or electronic trip breaker that's simple that's very cost competitive with thermomagnetic and really that's a big improvement in places where you have larger breakers uh that cost might be zero or we may we may only be able to get solid state so um so the protection is getting better per dollar with with your solid state breaker um and then on the top end you have what i'm calling um solid state microprocessor and uh i, I think i call it something else down further in the presentation but it's kind of nebulous because it's a um essentially it's the solid state breaker whatever the state of the art is today 
and they begin they've begun to diverge where we have your simple solid state and now we have we have circuit breakers with these amazing capabilities built into them all due to the advance in having um basically little computers microprocessors and this massive amount of computing power in a little space can now be leveraged into a circuit breaker so uh these are these are always adjustable um and, and a lot of times they have extreme amount of adjustments that you can do to them the pros are too many i'll get into some later but they're um they're too many to list in, in a short list the cons are the cost goes up and the also the complexity goes up so if if you need a simple solution for a relatively um straightforward customer and you're not packaging it as a as a, um, uh, a giant system these advanced trip units can get too complicated uh so i'll get to that a little bit more so each three each of the three really has their own market to, to them okay i i wanted to touch on this really quick um these are some historical uh, stuff that, that were called trip units, and a lot of them are gone, but because, you know, I'm assuming a lot of you, a lot of you are easy power users and are in the industry, and you're looking at existing facilities, they still exist out there. There's the series trip, also called dash pot trip unit, and those were installed in power circuit breakers from the very inception. So it's basically it's a switchgear trip unit. And they used a series of magnets and um, dampened oil plungers to provide uh, instantaneous, and then the, the oil plunger would provide the delay or the inverse time trip response. Really cool things. Um, and if they, were, if they were maintained correctly and calibrated, they were actually pretty accurate and advanced. But, but they've, all, um, they've all seen their better days. And... If you run across any of them, it, it's probably best to have them replaced. You can usually use the same breaker. So say it's an old um, General Electric uh, AKD uh, 2 breaker. You can do a trip unit replacement and put a modern microprocessor trip unit onto an old old power circuit breaker. And then the first generation of the solid state trip unit were these analog electric or these analog electronic circuit boards and they use resistors and um, uh, diodes and transistors and they were really simple and they're an improvement but one of the one of the disadvantages is that the electronics were so simple that they really couldn't measure RMS values so they were they were peak sensing and that caused some difficulty in the industry for a couple of years so they they lived around 80s through maybe mid 90s and um i don't think anybody still manufactures breakers like that so you'll probably see these out there um and you probably have to coordinate to them because they may be existing and they're not going to replace it so now we get into the um the thermomagnetic trip unit relatively simple i probably kind of already covered it but you have a um uh thermal element um and this 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 slide i'm sorry this slide is for thermal the thermal element only so you have your thermal element which is a biometallic strip um then your trip bar which is what opens the um the contacts for the breaker and then this biometallic strip as it gets hotter it, it will bend um in one direction and then basically trigger the mouse trap and open a breaker the the thermal response is is kind of an i squared t response um with a little bit of a curve to it uh let's see here yeah this just explains it uh bending bimetallic strip trip bar open contacts magnetic portion is a coil and once the coil gets enough current flowing through it it'll be able to pull in a plunger which throws the latch so very simple but there's no time delay on it it's either it's either open or closed. There's no, there's no middle ground. And that's just an explanation of what I said here. So, plunger, simple mechanism, and that's it. That's the that's the tripping of a thermomagnetic breaker. Uh, here's some 
here's some curves just so you can see the the, the um, response of it. Some of you, you know, may not be familiar with the time current curves, but essentially all it is is it's a um, it's a graph that shows you um, at what amperage and what time a circuit breaker is expected to trip. And these bars, this big purple, that's one circuit breaker. The blue, it's another circuit breaker. And um, you 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 read it by okay. I have a fault current of let's say it's um uh where we go here. That's an amps thing. This is times ten. So let's say well that's a two fifty a hundred. Okay, so that's here is a hundred amps. So let's say okay, I have two hundred amps of a of fault or overload, and the breaker will uh will start the time does nothing does nothing. And then it gets into this area. And this is the area where the breaker will trip. And it'll trip anywhere in this region. This is sort of a um, uncertainty region, uh, unknown band. So it could trip at the bottom, it could trip at the top. And, and there's some significant difference in time because this time scale here is a log. And this is a log. So this time here is a lot longer than this time here would be. Uh, so for example, if you're at 200 amps, it's going to trip between 40 seconds and 200 seconds. So you can see that's a pretty, pretty wide band. This is your thermal component of the breaker, this curved part, and then the bottom, that's your magnetic element. So you can see that the bottom uh, magnetic element is not going to do anything until it reaches its pickup value, and whenever it does, it's going to trip right away. Uh, so that's your instantaneous protection and your thermal is your overload protection. Um, solid state, it's got a little, a little introduction for you. This circuit breaker is from a uh, Celtronic, I believe, uh, Westinghouse Celtronic breaker from the late 70s. And you can see how, how simple it was, just capacitors, resistors, and I know there's a couple diodes in here uh, for to make, make to generate power, uh, transistors, so, Really simple trip unit, really simple electronics, and this was a peak sensing unit. Uh, so interesting for the day, but uh, essentially obsolete. The basic components in a solid state trip unit is you have some circuit board or boards that act as the logic or, or brain of the breaker. Like I said, early designs uh, had just discrete components. Uh, modern are Definitely integrated circuits and even up to microprocessors, depending on the, the um, uh, complexity of the breaker. Current sensor, when you get into the trip units, the trip units don't directly measure the current like a thermomagnetic trip unit does. These use sensors to, to measure the current and then feed them into the brain. So these sensors are iron core uh, uh, current transformers. The iron core current transformer, if you know, much about it at low currents they're very inaccurate um they get they actually get more accurate as the current goes up so they work really well for um for protection purposes but not so good for um measuring and metering um and these have, these have been replaced recently by another sensor called a Rogowski coil that um it gives you a much better uh accuracy throughout the entire range of, of the coil, that the entire range of the measurement. Sometimes there would be a rating plug, and so when you figured out what your um, what your nominal trip value is, it was usually, okay, I got a current sensor of in my break in my breaker of 200 amps, and my rating plug is an 80. So the rating plug is where the breaker would trip, and Sometimes those were interchangeable, so you could have a one breaker with interchangeable rating plugs that you go from, you know, uh, 50 amps to 250 amps. Range pretty widely throughout the um, throughout the industry. Steady adjustment. Um, most most solid state units have at least some adjustability to them. Like I said before, it could be something just move the instantaneous up and down, or it could be a, a tracking. Or it could be um, uh, full LSI uh, or LSI with ground fault. And um, the typical adjustments were you had a rotary dial, 
uh, dip switches, which ABB uses, and um, slider switches. Uh, so that's how you would make your your adjustment. This is a little section on the uh, the peak the peak sensing. Basically, you get a waveform like this with any kind of harmonic content, and this has a uh, 20% third harmonic. The peak value is going to change. So this harmonic RMS value, because of the because of the um, that harmonic third, this is going to be probably equal to 100 amp worth of true RMS. But since the peak sensor only looks at 100 percent. This current, which it should trip at in terms of RMS, the breaker will sit there and not do anything. And the opposite is true too. If you have a harmonic that uh, is really peaky, you could hit the peak sensor below the RMS value. So, I'm sorry, I'll go back. Those, it, it, that's a historical artifact because nobody makes them anymore. But you will see them in the in the field, and it, it can be a problem. So if you have some strange tripping activity. On a breaker that serves a harmonic load, you may want to look into it and see what type of breaker it is, because you may have run into this problem. It's still out there. The last component of it is uh, into the important was thermal memory. The um, the earlier trip solid state trip units didn't really remember; they didn't have a thermal memory. So when you got to an overload current that started to pick up, if that over overload current suddenly went away so you can look at this um this picture here a is your uh current and this is this ground fault current and you can see it goes up and down up and down up and down and here is what the breaker is recording so it sees okay i got a spike and i pick up oh spike went away another one so it's got all these events going on which is thermally adding up as damage to the equipment but the breaker doesn't see it. The breaker is blind. It thinks there's, these are basically five discrete events. When you add memory onto the breaker, it integrates all those together. So it's, it's giving you a true, it's giving you a true protection of what is actually happening at at the load uh, thermally. So that's a big improvement that is actually just being enforced now in the new. UL 489 um, standard. So the standards requiring a thermal memory with a retention test in order for a breaker to have that UL listing. And th that's frankly, we had our um, our spectra line of breakers and our standard spectra, which was electronic trip to our RMS, didn't have a memory. So we're, we're bringing that breaker into obsolescence because this was one of the drivers because we would have had to do a um, a major redesign to bring that breaker up to um, the new UL listing, which I, I think is coming into effect next year or the year after. Here's a here's a typical curve, and this would be a uh, solid state with um, LSI adjustment. And you see, it's all pretty complicated. But once again, your current on on your x-axis, your time on your y-axis, but you have now these three regions. You have long time which in this case we're saying above 10 seconds short time which is um between like a few cycles six to 12 cycles and into the seconds region and then you have your instantaneous region so you have all these adjustments available to move these curves um, left and right and up and down so you'd have uh for example your long time pickup be um multiples of whatever rating the breaker is. If it's a 100 amp breaker and you want um, uh, 80 amps to pick up, you'd set that to 0.8, so 80%. And then your short time, you can bring that up past the breaker rating. So again, if you have a 100 amp breaker, but you have it on, for example, a motor load, well, you want that, you want that short time to be higher so that it allows the motor to start and get through its all its starting current. So you, you could set your short time, for example, to uh, 6x. So that would be 600 amps. So the breaker will trip trip in, in a long time at 80, but, it'll, but it will wait uh, and won't trip unless you exceed uh, 600 amps between this time here of a few cycles to five or six seconds to allow, to allow the motor to start. And then you have your, 
instantaneous pickup. And um, so you can set your instantaneous really high to get over usually like a magnetic inrush on a motor or a transformer. And, and usually uh, you can get that. Typically you can get a 10X. There are breakers with larger, you can get a 13 and a 15X breaker. Um, but typically it's a, a 10 to one ratio. So your long time pickup uh, of 100 amps, your instantaneous maximum would be 1,000 amps. So that's a typical range. But all these are adjustable. So uh, you go into your easy power, you produce the curve, you produce the breaker that you want, and then you make all these adjustments so that uh, the breaker fits the performance that you want to do, and then also coordinates with another breaker. So this, this purple is your... Um, uh, the purple is your smaller breaker, say 100 amps, and then your blue is a uh, larger breaker, say 250, and you can see that uh, the, the purple, if it, say it had a uh, 900 amp fault, the purple will trip before the blue does anything. So the, these breakers are, are coordinated. Um, now you got your, um, now you got your advanced solid state uh, trip unit, and for this one, I'm only going to I'm kind of base it off of uh, the ABB's product line. Uh, so what I was telling you before were very generalizations of what's available in the market, and what I'm going to get into now is what ABB has released as its its premier flagship line of breakers, which is the um, which is the uh, XT uh, T Max XT for a molded case, and our, our trip units are called E Kip. So that's a new family of breakers, and it's available with a um, a really advanced solid state trip unit. So this is just to give you a flavor of some stuff you can now do with a molded case breaker that that you couldn't do in the past. You can get this breaker with voltage protections, uh, under voltage, over voltage. Typically, a lot of the protections have two levels to them, so you can either um, have a backup or you can switch in and out two different setting groups phase sequence power protections um uh reverse active power so reverse power flow um directional overcurrent these are protective functions that you've never seen in low voltage breakers uh, these these were reserved for protection protective relays but now now they're they're into the um the molded case and low voltage power circuit breaker market. So it's it's a huge jump in technology. Frequency protection, advanced voltage protection, uh, the, the, the voltage controlled overcurrent, which um, um, that, that basically it moves the overcurrent trip based on the retained voltage. So that would be uh, good for a generator. A second voltage restrained overcurrent, ROCOF is rate of change of frequency. That would be good for generators and microgrids. Uh, adaptive protection. You can set between two different setting groups depending on what you're doing. Uh, or for example, I can automatically do it. So for example, you can have a setting group that allows a transformer to get to its inrush. So it's, it's set, a, set a little bit higher. And then once two or three seconds go by, the breaker automatically will switch to a lower protective setting because it's already gotten to the inrush, and so it it gives you protection that can range on devices that are that are tricky, like a transformer, where you really really would like to have it know what condition, what state the the load is in. So that's a pretty interesting interesting development. And also, we we have uh, basically uh, like a, a PLC capability now built into these breakers. There's a it, it, we call it interface protection, but we can do logical load shedding based on grid conditions. We can do load shedding um, based on pure load. There's a built-in transfer switch function, which if you have two breakers, you can set them up essentially with a single cable, and they'll interlock with each other and operate as a um, as a transfer switch, not not a true transfer switch because it's not listed as one, so it would be considered more of an automatic throwover. But it'll do all the functions that a transfer switch will do, but with just two breakers and and no and no PLCs. Synchro reclosing, so we can um, we can do paralleling boards with molded case circuit breakers. 
power controllers so we can we can do peak shaving uh with you know with, with with generators or a time of day control and all these breakers can be remotely opened and closed um if you get the the accessory to them this this uh what we call touch chip unit for tmax it, it's got a um it's got enhanced metering capability and the the original solid state trip units were kind of poor in their ability to meter we had metering functions built into them but their accuracy was about five percent at best these breakers all use the um the newer technology Rogowski coil so you can get a pretty high accuracy class just from the breakers trip unit alone so if, for example you can do um class one half a percent current half percent voltage one percent power and energy which, which is a, a pretty good jump from where it where it used to be and then connectivity and that, that's a big um uh that's a big jump in the solid state world in the solid state trip unit world where you can hook up multiple breakers together um and either pull them um sort of like a simple modbus hierarchy or you can even have breakers talk to each other with some some of the newer protocols uh like for example this iec 61850 lets horizontal communication take place where you're doing uh a feeder to feeder feeder to main so you can you can set up some really interesting both data collection and also control when you have the breakers all all communicating with each other and then in ours we've we've developed a, we have a bluetooth module where if you are so inclined you can do your your settings uh in a, in a near field bluetooth environment so that you didn't have to get close to the breaker to you know alter its settings or or do what you have to with it so that's kind of a nice uh arc flash uh safety safety feature and then our these this tmax line of breakers uh, you can actually download new functions to them so you can you could buy a simple package of functions and then if you find out down the road you need um uh some frequency protection where well, you can then download that package and install it to the breaker so it doesn't require replacing the breaker or taking it out of service you can do it you can you can do it on the fly remotely over over a network so it's it's we're calling it a kind of future ready uh feature i try to start wrapping it up here here's here's a um uh summary of the applications um so thermomagnetic it, it provides good protection for simple stuff uh panels cables transformers very reliable very reliable um very low cost uh sensitive to ambient little adjustability very hard to coordinate and uh and this is very hard to coordinate for this uh 0.1 second which is the healthcare coordination code that's way too deep to get into on this this class uh solid state um you get much enhanced overcurrent protection uh and, you get the ability to ground fault, um, not GFCI, but ground fault, because GFCI is a, a, a branch breaker, human safety protection. High reliability. Basically, all the breakers in all these classes have really high reliability anymore, so there's not, that's really not an issue. Cost is medium. It's, it's definitely over thermomagnetic in most cases, except when you get into the larger frames, they actually get to be parity or thermomagnetics not even available anymore. So the cost has come down significantly and, and you can probably get some solid state breakers in places at the same price where you could get thermomagnetic. Insensitive to ambient changes in temperature, uh, adjustable, better selectivity than you would get in the thermomagnetics. You can do a, a two to one ratio, which is, or better actually, which is comparable to fuses. So you, you could do a, you could coordinate a 50 amp breaker with a 100 amp breaker solid state without, a, without an issue. And you could probably do better um, up to like a 1.5 1. 1. to 1. Full selective coordination is still an issue. Uh, and then when you get to your advanced, we, we kind of covered that um, comprehensive protection, different, a whole host of different protective elements for current voltage power. 
you, I haven't really got into this, but you, there's some uh, good arc flash protection that you can build into the systems. Metering, uh, communications, um, built-in logic. Uh, you can get these to be fully selective by using uh, technologies like um, zone selective interlocking. We can do differential schemes. So there's a, there's a whole host of um, ways that you can get these to be a, a fully selective system. Here's just a couple, I'll try to get through real quick because I know we're running out of time. I just did a couple real real simple examples um, to give you an idea of, of how to, where these things can apply. Here's a thermal magnetic application where we're protecting a transformer. Uh, you can see here, got our main bus, it's 480. And then you have a breaker that's feeding the transformer that steps down to 208 and it has a secondary protection. And so your purple is your secondary and your green is your primary protection. And the red line here is the thermal damage curve of the transformer. So you can see that uh, that both breakers will trip before you hit that thermal damage curve on the circuit breaker. And then also I, I plotted the cables damage curve. So that cable is this cable right here. So you can see that this green breaker is protecting the blue cable damage curve. Um, so the point I was making with this is that the thermomagnetic breakers, if applied correctly, are, are, are perfectly capable uh, of providing good protection for, um, for basic components. This is an interesting thing, uh, this inrush where the the blue breaker has to clear it and the purple breaker, it doesn't matter. But this inrush, these have become a lot larger over the years. Back six, seven years ago, people were using eight times number for this. Well, now with the with these trans, these new uh, transformers that are compliant to a um, the new DOE energy code, that number has jumped from eight to 12, which is, um, has become problematic in some cases because the normal breaker that you'd use to protect that transformer has too low of an instantaneous and will, and may or may not trip when you energize that transformer. So that's another another discussion for another day, but thermal mags can take care of that. It just has to be sized correctly. And then this was just a solid state example. And what I did here was I showed a mixture of thermomagnetic, which is this green. Uh, the blue is... Um, uh, a standard uh, LSI, a normal no, normal solid state trip unit, and then the purple and the green are um, more advanced units. So what I'm trying to convey with this is that first of all, you can stack up your um, you can stack up your solid state trip units in a much closer fashion than you can with your thermal mags because they're that uncertainty point where they where they're accurate. Is, is much thinner and you can move them around a lot more. But this is the one piece I really wanted to convey. So you can see there that um, this blue uh, standard LSI solid state trip is conflicting with the, uh, the lighter blue um, thermal mag breaker. And well, okay, what are you gonna do about it? Well, I really can't fit this. I can't make any changes because it's trapped up here and it's trapped down here. But if you notice, this is a straight line, but the purple and the green are are slightly curved. So what these curves are are um, uh, this is set to extremely inverse, and this breaker doesn't have that functionality. So in this specific case, you would have to upgrade this normal solid state trip to a solid state trip that you could adjust the curve type, because if you could adjust this curve and match extremely inverse it would turn a little bit and be perfect and perfectly fit in, into that area. So this is kind of a, I'll go back up. This is kind of a, a probably not too common, but uh, this is a case where um, you really want to go, you're going to really need an advanced solid state trip unit versus um, a more simplified solid state. Uh, I know I'm kind of rushing through this stuff because I'm trying to meet the time. Here, just to end the thing, th this is our, this is our flagship line of breakers that we've just released uh, starting last year. And we have the, 
we have a full range of molded case up to um, 1200 amps, which would be our, our XT7. Here's a table, and, and the important thing to take from the table is that almost all these breakers are um, available in thermomagnetic and and solid state. This is electronic, it would be solid state. So there's actually a mistake here because this, this XT1 is thermomagnetic. I'll go back. This XT1 breaker is thermomagnetic only, and, and it doesn't come in an electronic version. But the interesting point is that we can get our LSI breakers down to really low trip values, whereas in the past we had some difficulty because we had to go to bigger frames. Uh, so our, our, we had to use a um, uh, 600 amp frame to get LSI, whereas uh, that was in Spectre world. Now in the new world that we're in with Tmax, we can have a 125 amp frame breaker with, and we can we can dial it down to 10 amps with LSI. So that's a big jump because a, a breaker cost is proportional to frame size. So a 125 amp frame always going to cost a lot less money than a um, than a 600 amp frame. So now we have that technology available across a, a much greater span of uh, breaker sizes. So this just shows you um, our line of uh, trip units that fit in those breakers are thermomagnetic, uh, E-kip dip, which is a, a normal solid state trip unit, and then our what we call touch or high touch, and that's uh, that's your um, uh, top of the line uh, advanced solid state trip unit. So you can get standard protection in all of them, but then you get all this other stuff that you can do with the advanced unit the advanced protections are like your voltages and frequencies and power flows. You can communications, measurements, embedded functions, PLCs, stuff like that, and then you can upgrade it. So that's that's the big differentiator. What this slide doesn't convey correctly is that EKIP and the LSI solid state gives you more than standard protection because it, this is LSI. I would consider standard protection to be thermomagnetic. So there should be a um, I'm going to change it and put another another category here that says uh, adjustable protection LSI uh, because these two are not definitely not the same. Uh, that was that was it. I'm sorry, I got, had a lot of stuff to get through, so I, you know, I had to rush a little bit. But um, uh, I guess it's open to questions now. If you have anything anything you want to ask, Andrew, we've got quite a few questions, and unfortunately, we're pretty close to being out of time. How about if we uh, send out a Q&A response to the whole group uh, after you get a chance to kind of go over the questions themselves? Yeah, that works. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for attending. But, uh, Andrew, it's a great job. Thank you very much for the presentation. And as I say, we will uh, do a Q&A response to everyone that uh, entered questions online. Yeah, thank you. I want to, I want to say thanks to um to the team at Easy Power for inviting me to do this. This was a it's a great opportunity. I think we'll have you on again in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks. Take care. So long.